Hello, everyone. Welcome to another snippet on what pharmacies do. Today, I have the honor of having with me a pharmacist that is really passionate about what pharmacists can do for patients and for the public. I have with me Dr. Mohamed Jallo. Hi, Dr. Jallo. Hey, Dr. Wabu. Right. I'm Thank so, you. Like I said, I'm really honored you're here. As a matter of fact, I think oh. when we're done, I'm going to go change my profile to public figure because oh, no. I feel like I'm interviewing a star right oh. now. You were my preceptor in residency years in 2017 at Clinical A. You're an avid researcher, writer. I've read your work on drug topics, pharmacy times, CNN opinions, and oh. my... My most recent favorite, uh, Andres Armour. Oh. <laughs> Fun and easy book that teaches kids and their parents about vaccines. So I'm really, really honored that you said yes to being here to share with us your experience, uh, your pharmacy journey, and, and what um, you think pharmacists can do um, for the public. So again, thank you. Welcome. How are you? I'm good. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for giving us a voice to allow us to share what we're going through. And it's, you know, amazing pharmacists like you that allow us to feel comfortable to share this. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. It means the world to me. Thank you so much. Um, okay, let's start. Uh, can you oh, tell yeah. us how did you decide that pharmacy was the right career choice for you? And how has that journey been up to where you are today? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you could probably tell by the last name, you know, or by the full name, you know, I have African origins. Luckily, both of my parents are from West Africa, specifically mm -hmm. Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, growing up, I mean, you could probably test, you know, a lot. There is a lot of professions that they made it clear, like, here's what we want you to do. They were like, we'll be proud of you if you become this. Right. <laughs> So you I know, know what you're talking about. Yeah. And I, and we can all attest like in yeah. the African <laughs> yeah. community, there's like three, right? Either you own a business, mm -hmm. you're a lawyer, or the yes. last one, or you're a doctor. That's and right. I say that with the mm -hmm. accent, you are a doctor. Like, <laughs> you know, that's what my parents yeah. really doctor or lawyer or a lawyer. You know, mm -hmm. I and hear get you. business. I feel you. Yeah. Oh yeah. So that's so, why mm -hmm. growing up, that's where they and you know, they instill like, hey, these are good professions to look into. And I always liked helping people. I always liked helping people. Uh, my dad, he was a pharmacy technician at a hospital. So that's where I kind of got introduced to the idea of pharmacy. Okay. But I didn't, I spoke to him, but then I actually met a community pharmacist at CVS. Her name was Leslie Harnish. She mm -hmm. was a great pharmacist um, in Reading, Pennsylvania. I called her up. I said, hey, I want to learn a little bit more about pharmacy. Is it okay if I come and interview you? So she brings me to the pharmacy. Mm -hmm. She shows me how much of an impact she has because I'm thinking, oh, all they do is count pills. But she, I see she was actually a community leader. Wow. People would go to her before they go to the doctors and they would ask her advice for so many things that are even outside of just medications with wow. lifestyle habits. Wow. So when I seen the impact she was having, I said, oh, you know what? I like this. So I spoke to her and she was actually a great mentor to me where she even offered me a job to be a pharmacist or a pharmacy technician at that CVS pharmacy gotcha. while I was in undergrad. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I got into a uh, pharmacy school at Wilkes University, one of, mm -hmm. I think, a really good pharmacy school. Mm -hmm. Did my four years there. And after I graduated uh, from Wilkes University, then I did a postdoctoral fellowship right out the gate um, at Creighton University. Mm -hmm. My fellowship was in drug information and evidence-based medicine. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, that's when I learned I wanted to do teaching. Um, and that's what kind of led me to my career. But when I was there, I was picking a very dry subject. I was finding innovative ways to teach it. So that's when I said, you know, I kind of like teaching and I like the idea of translating something that's very complex mm -hmm. and making it easy for people to understand. So mm -hmm. that's when um, mm -hmm. I sent in my application and then I got, you know, you know, Core University reached out and I met up with Emily Chan yeah, at um, ACCP. Yeah, yeah. He, told me, hey, you know, I, we have a position available or you should apply. And she was great. And I networked with her. And then I submitted my application and then the rest was history. Wow. You, your story hits all the points um, of, first of all, family influence as <laughs> just an African like you. And when yep. the African father says, uh, this is what I suggest. <laughs> Usually, not a suggestion, is what you must do. <laughs> and 
then along the way, you had a great preceptor, which again emphasizes the importance of reaching out. If you're thinking about doing something, you reached out, you interviewed, um, you confirmed your 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 passion for the field. Um, ACCP, you meet Dr. Chen, networking. So your story has a lot of those important aspects that um, anyone thinking about pursuing a career in pharmacy or any career must take. You have to test the water, you have to have mentors, and you have to network. So oh, what... Yeah. Um, what an amazing story. Um, I'm so happy that I ran into you as a resident because I'm using <laughs> um, a lot of the drug information researches that you uh, you you showed me as a resident. I'm still using them today. Oh, good. Now, that's good to hear that. I mean, you show like, I mean, that's what made you a good resident because you can have good mentors, mm -hmm. but you also have to be mm -hmm. someone that can be taught. And I think Absolutely. that's a big issue that some people have will them. have great mentors, but if mm -hmm. they're not able to be taught, mentors wasting yeah. their time where for you yeah. you actually you know will listen and you know seek our advice seek our guidance and then we will give it to you and you would execute on it and that's yeah. why you it made you like a hallmark resident to work with so that's why when this came up i'm like oh of course i would love to do this i want to give back because <laughs> you made you gave back peace to a lot of us preceptors so i just want to say you did a good job with that Thank you, thank you, thank you. And this is about you, not me, okay? <laughs> okay. Let's get back to you. Let's get back to you. So okay. what is the best thing you like about, what is your favorite thing about being a pharmacist? I would say we're like that um, the hidden hero. I would say we're like the hidden hero that people don't realize is like, oh my God, like we really need the pharmacist. Yes. Um, I think that's yes. what I would say is the best thing. I yes. like it because- Yes. yes. We are hidden heroes, but we still get recognition. And I think we get recognition from the prescribers we're working with mm -hmm. or from the mm -hmm. patients or the family members that mm -hmm. we're working mm -hmm. with because mm -hmm. they realize what we intervention we do. Mm -hmm. And they come and tell us like, wow, if you didn't mm -hmm. tell us that, we would not have known. Yes. Or a physician will tell us, oh, I didn't know about that study, about that drug. Thank God you told us about it. And we made an intervention based upon that. Yeah. So I think that's probably been the favorite okay. thing, being a hidden hero. Now, okay. are we on TV, you Absolutely. know, like on Grey's Anatomy? No. Nope. But we're still should having we impact. Don't. We, we should, should you know. <laughs> we should, you know, we could come up with a script, you we know, should. go shop around, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I've thought about I, that. Yeah, we're the hidden here. I get doctors all the time saying, thank you for saving my butt on that, you know, yeah. that intervention that you made. And it's it's one thing for it's amazing when uh providers actually acknowledge us and recognize us. And that's why I we I started doing this what pharmacies do because I feel like we were hidden. And mm -hmm. if we can get out in the public more and kind of just spread the word about what we do and get um patients to be more aware of what they can come to us for for services. Exactly. So yeah, we're definitely the hidden heroes. Oh yeah. So that's um, what I would describe us as. Absolutely. I agree with you. I agree with you. Um so now you're working at Tour University. So, yes. Clinical lay. Uh, which encompasses academia and uh, ambulatory care, I would say, right? So what does a pharmacist do in that setting? So yeah, so luckily I've been blessed when being able to help at Lifelong as well. So oh. um, I've been transitioning and helping at Lifelong. Oh, but the big thing that we do is mm -hmm. we come up with a treatment regimen. So luckily um, a patient will be diagnosed with, let's say, type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. The physician will say, hey, I did the tough job of diagnosing. Mm -hmm come to me and my team and say, hey, can you manage their diabetes by making adjustments on their medication? Mm -hmm. so then for us, we have full authority on mm -hmm. making mm -hmm. dose adjustments, whether it's increasing a dose, decreasing, discontinuing medications. Yep. So it's been really rewarding that we have that level of autonomy. So that's yep. like a key thing we've done. Yeah, We're doing yep. follow-up visits. We're ordering lab values and not only mm -hmm. ordering them, we could see them and then mm -hmm. make changes based upon them. Yeah. And we're also right. doing med reconciliations a lot where we're verifying medications and then doing drug drug interaction checks. Mm -hmm. The other big thing I, and I appreciate is we're doing a lot of direct patient education. Yeah. We're, we're explaining drugs, how it works in like simple terms. And yeah. it's also and the, probably the best thing I love is really working with students where I'm seeing what I'm translating and seeing the students doing the same thing in their own way. So that's yeah. been the beautiful thing of giving mm -hmm. back to the community mm -hmm. or giving mm -hmm. back to the profession, mm -hmm. uh, not only helping patients, but then helping my students be better yeah. providers so that they can help patients in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
you reminded me of, of something that one of our professors said when I was a student. I think it was probably Dr. Yoshizuka, our law professor. And yeah. he had someone had asked him where he sees the future of pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And he says, I see providers diagnosing and just handing it over to the pharmacist. Okay, here, this patient has this. You do what you want to do with the patient. You start the medications. You manage the medications until the patient is better at goal or in recovery or whatever the term is for that specific disease state. So um, you reminded me of that. So you are, do you work with diabetes or other only or other uh, disease states? No, I primarily, I would say diabetes, but no, gotcha. I've had experience working with patients of, who have hypertension, dyslipidemia, mm -hmm. but I've also mm -hmm. helped patients who had depression, um, gout. Um, for me, I have expertise in men's health related mm -hmm. topics. Mm -hmm. I've had mm -hmm. patients who had BPH or enlarged mm -hmm. prostate, mm -hmm. erectile dysfunction, mm -hmm. COPD, pretty much most chronic yeah. disease states that they yeah. manage in family medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of family medicine providers felt comfortable with me helping them manage their patients with that. And Promise especially if they can do it. We can do it, especially if the yeah. disease is primarily managed with medications and there's dose adjustments. Mm -hmm. They feel that we're very credible and they've appreciated it because we found like dosing targets they didn't realize we could do. Or they yeah. we identified drug drug interactions that they didn't realize that were actually clinically significant okay. or in which we they probably appreciate the most. We would find a more appropriate therapeutic recommendation saying instead of doing this, mm -hmm. why don't we use this intervention that could tackle all of these disease states at once instead of using a one drug for each disease state yeah so prevent polypharmacy and and all that stuff yeah absolutely exactly. yeah you did mention patient care i love hearing uh patient stories do you have a story that stands out to you about an interaction you have with a patient and that the patient was really appreciative of Oh, yeah. Now, I think one of my favorite patients is one of them who is very hard of, you know, walking. OK. And she was primarily being managed um, with her diabetes by uh, like other healthcare providers. OK. And the challenge is she had diabetes. She was on a walker. They were giving her a lot of insulin because her A1C was a lot high. OK. okay. And because her A1C was high, they were giving her more insulin. But if you're on a walker. She had a higher risk of hypoglycemia and higher risk of falls. Yeah. So what do you think happened? They were increasing it because her sugars were high. <sighs> and mm -hmm. of course, she was having falls. So mm -hmm. as a patient, what did she do? She's like, I'm not taking it. I'm not taking that medication. Yeah. So that's why uh, her A1C stayed elevated, despite them increasing it over the time. Yeah. So what I did is I actually connected with the patient. And I said, you know what? I see what's going on. And then I said, well, why is it you don't want to take it? Now, why don't you want to take your medicine? I mean, it's working mm -hmm. and they're using high doses. What's going on? So then I find out the real reason she's actually falling is because she has a fear of blood. And when she sees blood, she essentially faints. Oh. So when they were having her check her fingers and prick her finger, she was fainting every single time. Or not every, but majority of the time. Come on, yeah. So yeah. that's why she wasn't taking her med. And mm -hmm. that's why even if they would increase it, she would take it once, her sugar would drop. And then she would fall and it just was a cycle. So what I did is I met with her as a person instead of just focusing on a drug. I said, let's work with her as a person. Mm -hmm. So we started her at a very low dose. Mm -hmm. And then I came up with a titration schedule mm -hmm. that was had a lower risk of hypoglycemia. Mm -hmm. And then she would have the schedule and she would adhere to it. And we tried to find her perfect number where she would eventually... We estimate, okay, if we bring her insulin to this number, her sugar should be likely controlled. Mm -hmm. we get to that. She's feeling fine. She's taking her insulin every day. Guess what? Next three to six months, she's at goal. Wow. And for the past two years, she's been at goal ever since we wow. did that. Wow. And she wow. went from mm -hmm. literally fainting every day when she would check her sugars to now she can actually do some basic stuff that she never thought she could. Yeah. So that's like an example yeah. of a patient that we had impact on. And it really yeah. took just connecting with the patient at the human connecting connecting versus just solely focusing on the medication mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i always remember someone or in school someone saying treat the patient not the numbers yep treat this <laughs> i wonder who <laughs> we may not have known what the numbers were in this patient yeah. in this specific patient case but just i've noticed just taking the time to talk 
to the patient directly and say what's going on, what's happening, not even addressing the medications directly, just the patient feeling that you care about them as a person is enough for them to even listen because you can increase the dose all you want if they don't take it or if they don't check their blood sugars, it's really useless. So I really love personally the the one-on-one -on -one interaction, the direct patient care that we can have with our patients and make a difference, um, not only in their health, but also in, in their lives. Because some patients just like that connection with the healthcare provider and feeling like they're part of um, a family, so to speak. Someone's there that cares about them. And, and pharmacists are in a great position, just like where you are to do that. I awesome. I okay, agree. we're winding down. We're winding down. Oh, okay, yeah. Last question is yeah. um there's so many people out there that I've talked to that I know are interested in becoming pharmacists, but they they have some reservations. And I just want to sh you to share with us um any advice you have for someone out there that might be considering a career in pharmacy or even anyone that just graduated from pharmacy a new practitioner mm -hmm. on how to um how to proceed how to move on on their pharmacy journey yeah one is keep an open mind. and keep that open mind that you have a pharmacy degree you have a doctorate of pharmacy you can use those skills in mm -hmm. so many different areas. Mm -hmm. I've seen pharmacists who, like you, are podcast hosts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've seen pharmacists who are on um, doing TikTok videos, using their education to help educate other people. Yeah, I see pharmacists even working at healthcare startups, yep. as well as working um, as a consultant, working for pharmaceutical companies, like so many areas that value the critical skills that pharmacists have. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. think one big thing I see is maybe some people are still fixated that pharmacists only work in the community or pharmacists only work in a hospital. But luckily, we have a good skill set that we can apply in so many different areas. Absolutely. The pharmaceutical industry, mm -hmm. working directly at the CDC or the mm -hmm. FDA mm -hmm. or doing your own thing. I've seen pharmacists now. Mm -hmm. They're, I mean, doing doing real estate where they're using some of their clinical knowledge and their skills and are applying it to real estate with maybe assessing properties and things. So I would say, use don't think like your pharmacy knowledge is only related to just um, community or hospital. It's not. Be open to explore more opportunities, whether mm -hmm. it's in the FDA, whether it's mm -hmm. in a pharmaceutical company, mm -hmm. insurance company, mm -hmm. or come back and serve like, you know, in academia and say, hey, maybe yeah. I want to teach other pharmacists in the future, which we always need people who would come back and teach. So yeah. these are things that I would want people to be mindful of, that mm -hmm. pharmacy is not just community and hospital. There's so many areas mm -hmm. and you can tailor your expertise in so many different um, opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Keep an open mind because you never know um, what door will open to you next. And if you're going to like what's behind that door, I think another way someone put it is say yes. You know, yeah. when you get a call from your professor to to help out with the project, even if you're not interested in it, you can say yes and, and yeah. try it out and see. And then that project usually leads to another project, leads to another contact, leads to another network. And you may find yourself um, in a completely different um, field than than you ever imagined. Like I. I, I always knew I wanted to be in healthcare. I wasn't always sure about pharmacy, but now that I'm in pharmacy, I my mom used to say that I talk a lot, like that I could be a genius. <laughs> like my parents always wanted me to just be quiet. And I feel like, okay, now I'm a pharmacist and we have good writing skills. We have good communication skills. Um, and um, maybe now I can try and figure out, okay, how do I become a journalist as a pharmacist? Oh, yeah. And I, there's mm -hmm. a lot of people who love publications. Mm -hmm. and I'll be happy to can make you connections. They need yes. pharmacists mm -hmm. who can who know how to write about medications because you have journalists who can write using lay terms, but they may not understand the medication yes. as much as we do. So that's yes. why we've had opportunities to write, let's say, for Pharmacy Times or yes. Pharmacy Today. And they yes. appreciate having pharmacists versus someone where they have to teach them that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think you brought up a good point about yeah. projects. 
-hmm. I think that's another big piece of advice I would give. Yeah, yeah. Take on as much projects because I think as pharmacists, we have it a little bit backwards and it's counterintuitive, right? Yeah. As pharmacists, we're all like, okay, I have to get the training first. I have to get certified. Then I'll be qualified to take on a project. I think we should do the reverse. I think you should take on a project, even though if you don't have the skills, yeah. then you force yourself to grow and get the um, training and then the certifications to execute the project well. And yeah. then you'd be surprised how much you level up afterward. Yeah. And yeah. I I think that's so much better. And here's an example. Yeah. Um, I work like with one of my mentors, Dr. If. He's mm -hmm. a brilliant medical writer and he's just a brilliant pharmacist. Yeah, yeah. And I remember when he was, you know, pushing me to write like some of these articles, I was overwhelmed. I'm like, oh, well, let me do this training program about scientific writing. And it's just the pharmacist in me. I'm like, oh, well, let me do this training program. Let me do a practice pr paper. Then let me do it. No, I was given an opportunity to do a research mm -hmm. project, mm -hmm. actually write it with from the IRB to the actual manuscript, and we eventually got it published. Wow. And I gained so much skills from doing that versus saying, oh no, I have to give, take the training for that. I have to do the course for that. No, and I just know as pharmacists. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and I know as pharmacists. Training. Yeah, and, and it's, like you said, it's the pharmacists in us. We always think that we have to be qualified, yep. certified in this to be able to do this. But mm -hmm. no, there's it's it's doing it going for it that we get the hands-on experience and then maybe later on if we want we can decide to to train further if if need be but that project with dr ip opened up your passion for so many other uh writing projects and and um and things like that so absolutely oh, yeah. always keep an open mind and you can do anything that you want to do. And then you weren't comfortable with the writing. And nope. so getting out of your comfort zone, you, mm. I think it's Steve Harvey that said, you're not growing if you're comfortable. Oh yeah. You I always totally have agree. to try new things and learn and, and get comfortable with being uncomfortable. A hundred percent. You have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I know as pharmacists, we want to have everything perfect before we do something. Yeah. Not everything is a drug, drug interaction where we have to there do a drug, drug interaction check, make sure everything is fine before we say everything is good. Absolutely. It's okay for us to be unaware and then experiment. And it's okay if we try and fail because we learn, we learn from it. Um, and I think that's a big thing also I want to give off. Yeah. Um, it's okay to fail. Absolutely. And I would say Absolutely. someone gave this great quote, as long as you learn from a failure of trying something new, then consider it tuition. Consider that tuition if you learned from it. Yeah. yeah. But if you keep making the same mistake over, you're not learning from it, then whatever you're paying, you're paying a fine. Yeah. But that's oh the way my I God, put that's it. so good. Yeah. Yes. Yes. As long yes. as you make a mistake or you try something new, you fail, it's fine. As long as you learn from it, mm -hmm. then it's tuition. Mm -hmm. But if you keep doing it over and over again, you keep failing over and you're not learning, then you're going to keep paying that fine over and over and, and over, over, and over, and over until you learn from it. And eventually you're going to learn. And it's what, do you want to pay more in fines or do you want to pay more in tuition? I, I take tuition. Thank okay. you very much. <laughs> That's amazing. You want to fail for it. So you gave us like so many, so much open mind, fail forward. It's okay. I mean... We learned a lot from you today, Dr. Jallo. Um, if you have any questions for Dr. Jallo, you can reach out to me uh, right here on YouTube or Instagram, or wherever you're watching. Um, on my Rookie Pharmacist page, therookiepharmacist.com, I have a contact form there. It sends me an email directly, and I'll be very happy to put you in contact with Dr. Jallo if you have any questions about um, anything he just mentioned about academia, about research, about uh, clinical practice, ambulatory care, any of that, I'll be happy to put you in contact with him and he'll be happy to answer your questions. Right, Dr. Jallo? Anytime. For you, you are a great resident. You know, if you've been thank someone who you. keeps growing, I'll be happy to help serve you in that. <laughs> awesome. So awesome. And that concludes today's snippet on what pharmacies do. Until the next one, stay blessed. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care, everybody.